As we await Vice President Harris and Beyonce Knowles Carter in Houston together on stage, it is worth noting that Donald Trump also spent the day in Texas, where he spoke about immigration, saying the U.S. has become a, quote, dumping ground. He also issued a blanket denial of sorts related to uh, recent reporting about his authoritarian instincts, his fascist tendencies, and his admiration for dictators. And he stoked more skepticism about the election, with comments planting the seeds for the big lie 2.0. I'm not supposed to say it, but we are winning by a lot, actually. You know, these used to take one day. Now they go on forever. And bad things happen. Lots of bad things happen. Where are those votes that I saw two days ago? Oh, uh, well, we're painting that section, and we decided to move them, sir. Oh, you can't believe it. I'm, I'm joined once again by Simone Sanders Townsend and Julian Castro. Uh, Simone, here we go. Big lie 2.0. We're winning. And if we don't win, it's fraud. What, what, I mean, Democrats tend to, at least the, the Harris campaign is, Firmly anchored in the truth here as far as election fraud, which is that there has been vanishingly, there's been almost no election fraud historically, and especially now. So, I mean, I guess I wonder from the perspective of the, <laughs> no one can predict where the votes are right now and whether Donald Trump is in fact winning or losing. What do you think the appropriate response or counterpoint or rebuttal should be from Democrats as Donald Trump sows the seeds for the big lie 2.0? I would say last time um, he fraudulently claimed he won on election night when he had not won, when all the votes had not been counted. And I think that people should believe that he will do that again this time. The difference is the last time he did so from the East Room of the White House, the People's House, um, fraudulently claiming, standing in the White House, saying that he was, in fact, still going to be the next president. This time, he'll be doing it for Mar-a-Lago or somewhere in New York. Um, but the effect, I think, will still be the same. And so the a campaign should be very clear. I think the vice president has been clear that this is something that they are prepared for, um, that they are, um, uh, they are expecting that he will do it. He's already laying the groundwork. And I frankly think, I know we just had the senator on, but the states is where this fight is going to really rest have up more. I, I predict, frankly, that there will be more challenges to the state certifications prior to January 6th, a bunch of mini January 6th happening all across the country, actually. Well, and that is a terrifying thought indeed. Uh, Julian, uh, we're looking at a live shot. I don't know if you can see it in your monitor, but we're looking at a live shot of Traverse City, Michigan, where Donald Trump is supposed to be holding a rally. He is running extraordinarily late, I think, by some counts, up to two hours. People have started leaving that event. We will, I'm sure, momentarily go back to the live shot down in uh, the Shell Energy Arena down in Houston, where we are waiting any moment now. Beyonce Knowles Carter, Beyonce, <laughs> formally, and Vice President Harris, where it's a 30,000-person crowd, according to Harris campaign estimates. And I just want to talk a little bit about what you were, what you touched on in the last segment, which is the the coalition that has been assembled here in contrast to the coalition in Michigan. And look, you can't tell who's going to win on an election based on the attendance of one event. The diversity, the energy, the cultural relevance of what's happening in Texas, and then what's happening in Michigan, where, you know, today Donald Trump has been talking about the United States as a dumping ground, as a garbage can, where he invokes a message of just absolute darkness and apocalypse. Now, it's obviously resonating with some section of the electorate, but man, I just think there's something America likes about optimism and hope. And it's just an undeniable truth in American life that people do enjoy feeling good about the place in which they live and the community that they're a part of. Yeah, I mean, you see the images there and the contrast, Alex. I mean, one there in Houston, Harris's event is jubilant. It's celebratory. It's excited about, about the country that we are and the future and what we can create together, working together. And you see the other one. It's, you know, sort of downtrodden and, uh, you know, and, and somewhat mad at the world. That's how I think of a lot of, not all of, but a lot of Trump supporters uh, and, and he encourages that with the way that he talks about other people, how negative he is, and how negative he is, as you said, about our country. And what we've seen, you know, over the years generally is that Americans tend to go for optimism, not a blind optimism, but generally optimism, especially when you combine it with what Kamala Harris has combined it with, which is substance. 
and experience uh, and a path forward. Um, and it's just been extraordinary for me to see in these last two weeks, all of these things coalesce. And yeah, she has Beyonce and she has Bruce Springsteen and, and she has President Obama and, and, and folks that you would think, you know, both celebrities and then also people in politics would come and, and to her aid and help her in the end. But she also has all of those everyday Americans that are out there telling their stories about the hope that they have because of her and also the danger that they know that Donald Trump presents because of what they felt in their own lives, uh, either because of a, a bad pregnancy that they experienced um, or uh, other cruelty that they've experienced because of Trump and his policies or policies like it from others around the country. So it's, it's a whole cross section of America uh, that speaks to the need to turn that page and to go with someone who has a plan and who is optimistic uh, and who brings people together fundamentally and doesn't first try and tear people apart the way that Trump does. I have to believe, um, you know, if, if history is any guide, that ultimately people are still going to go for that over what we see on the other side. It's such a good point. And Simone, in addition to the the sort of staggering, the chasm that separates the two visions of America um, in terms of these two parties, there's just the reality that the Republicans have shown themselves to be explicitly uninterested in representative democracy, right? Like they're countenancing at the top of their ticket someone who incited a mob that wanted to stop the certification of electoral results or election results, that they have empowered state representatives and state actors who seek to engage in voter suppression. They have embraced legislation that is fundamentally at its core anti-democratic. And today in North Carolina, the leader of the House Freedom Congress, Maryland Representative Andy Harris suggested that the state of North Carolina, which is a swing state, should just go ahead and award the state's electoral votes to Trump now before any actual votes are tallied. Now, I believe he's since tried to walk those comments back a little bit, but they're, they're, not, they're saying the quiet part out loud at this point, Simone. And when it's so explicit, you'd got to think there are like 10 Nikki Haley voters out there who could decide this election, who are hearing this and saying, man, I know I care about the price of eggs, but that's pretty egregious. Yeah, and then and let's remember, the Nikki Haley voters, they didn't support Donald Trump at the primary. Even after Nikki Haley was no longer officially in the race, thousands of people continue to vote for Nikki Haley in primaries all over the country. Those are folks that I don't think are going to support Donald Trump in this general election. But you can't assume. You have to go out there and earn their votes. And I think the Harris campaign has been trying to do just that. I got to say, Simone Sanders Townsend and... It is 9 p.m. on the East Coast and 8 p.m. in Houston, Texas, where we are awaiting, as I just said, the one and only Beyonce Knowles Carter, Queen Bee to her fans, who is expected to take the stage soon at a rally in support of Kamala Harris. With just 11 days left until Election Day, Vice President Harris is down in the Lone Star State as part of an effort to put abortion rights back at the center of this campaign. Her campaign released a statement today calling Texas ground zero for the nation's extreme abortion ban, saying that more than any other state, the nightmare playing out in Texas for women is emblematic of the harm Donald Trump's abortion bans have caused across the nation. To that end, the Harris campaign has just released two new ads focused on the impact of Trump's abortion bans. Here's a look at one of them. For 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it. He did it. It was pretty devastating. He is bragging. Bragging about the rights that he stole from American women. And Trump is promising to do more. <sighs> In Project 2025. They are restricting birth control. Tracking pregnant women. Enforcing a nationwide abortion ban. The government should get out of my business. Stay out of my business. That's not the government's business. In America, women make their own decisions. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message. The Harris campaign also released a second powerful ad featuring a Texas woman named Andrea, who was denied an abortion after suffering pregnancy complications and nearly died of a septic infection as a result. Donald Trump was also in Texas today, where he sat for an interview with podcaster Joe Rogan and made the case that Texas is ground zero for his signature policy issue, immigration. Now, all of this comes on the heels of the final pre-election poll from the New York Times and Siena College, 
which shows Kamala Harris and Donald Trump tied nationally at 48 percent each. That poll found that abortion rights and immigration were tied as voters' second biggest concern in this election after the economy. We're going to be closely following what both campaigns are doing throughout this hour. But joining me now is Sherilyn Eiffel, civil rights attorney and former president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Sherilyn, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here tonight. I know you are probably as anticipating with great, great eagerness Beyonce Knowles Carter taking the stage with Kamala Harris, which should be happening momentarily. But I will say, you know, the timing, this is a sl the event slightly delayed, and it's a testament to the just incredibly challenging role Kamala Harris has to play as the Democratic presidential nominee in the final stretch of the campaign, and also the vice president of the United States, who is reportedly yeah. and quite obviously dealing with a kinetic situation in the Middle East. We have a readout from the White House that she was briefed on um, the Israel's retaliatory strikes in Iran this evening. Maybe that explains a little bit of the delay. But either way, walk and chew gum is an understatement when it comes to the task uh, at hand for Kamala Harris. Let me just get first your thoughts about going behind enemy lines as it were going to the sort of reddish state of Texas to make it the case for abortion. What do you think of that strategy? Yeah, I think that was I think it's really important. Um, frankly, Alex, you you know that, you know, Texas is a state that uh, in which Democrats have not been able to move turnout significantly. In 2020, there were six million registered voters in Texas who didn't vote. Uh, and so this is less about convic convincing people who uh, support Donald Trump to support Kamala Harris and more about getting those registered voters who have sat on their hands to come out and understand what's at stake. And in that sense, you know, tonight, uh, Vice President Harris being pulled into the Situation Room to be briefed on what's happening with Israel and Iran is a part of that. You know, there, there's lots of talk about whether the vice president is a leader, much of it tinged, in my view at least, with views about women and leadership, particularly in the military um, lane. And I think the fact that she's being briefed tonight is an important part of this. I do think that people around the world, including uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, are not afraid that she'll be weak. I think they're afraid that she'll be strong. Mm. Uh, and so I think this um, is kind of all part of, part and parcel of what she is showing the nation and has been showing the nation over the past few months. You make such a great point about how she's trying to motivate um, part of the electorate that may otherwise sit on their couch or sit out the election. We have some advanced yeah. excerpts from the Harris campaign about some of the stuff the vice president's going to stay on state, say on stage tonight. And one part really stuck out to me. I want to just read. This is from uh, the remarks she'll be making in, uh, momentarily in the hour. And though we are in Texas tonight, she's going to say, for anyone watching from another state, if you think you are protected from Trump abortion bans because you live in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Nevada, New York, California, or any state where voters or legislators have protected reproductive freedom, please know no one is protected because a Donald Trump national ban will outlaw abortion in every single state. I really feel like at the final stage of the campaign, it's an incredibly urgent message to communicate, right? Because there does yeah. seem to be, I'm not going to say an overconfidence, but it feels like the issue of abortion has lost a little bit of the urgency in the states where there have been um, protections, whether in the state constitution or the state legislatures. And the vice president's making a very salient point there. A national federal abortion ban, which could easily happen in a Trump second term, will affect these United States. Um, what do you think about you know, underscoring the urgency of that, Sherilyn, and what else the vice president yeah. needs to do to make that case. It's so, it, 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 it's so important. And I think the, the only piece missing is that the reason we are here and the reason we uh, have, you know, some 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 confidence that if Donald Trump signed a national abortion ban, that it, it would outlaw abortion around the country is because there's also a Supreme Court, um, you know, with three members appointed by Donald Trump who have um, demonstrated their willingness to um, allow these kinds of abortion bans to go forward. 
and it's dangerous for women all over the country. But, you know, fill in the blank, Alex. We can say this about everything to do with Donald Trump. Donald Trump wants to punish his enemies. He wants to prosecute those he thinks oppose him. Uh, there are people in, you know, your industry, in the legal profession, who also believe they will be immune from that. And the truth is, uh, no one is immune. Today, we heard that the Washington Post did not uh, post an editorial opposing uh, Trump and endorsing Vice President Harris because perhaps this is the story. The owner is worried about losing um, business deals if Trump becomes president. Uh, all of the people who are cowering right now are convincing themselves that on the other side of this, they're not going to face the wrath of Trump. But a dictator is never satisfied, and a dictator as egomaniacal as Trump would likely be, who needs constant obeisance, including from the business community, uh, is never going to stop. And so no one can believe that they are above uh, this. And everyone should understand that sooner or later it will come for them. This is when we should be holding together as a nation. Um, I, too, would like groceries to be cheaper, but most importantly, I'd like to live in a democracy. And so first things first, I think it's really important for Americans to be mature in this moment, to face and to, to confront what the reality is, the danger is that we are facing and do what is necessary to protect the republic. And I think Kamala Harris has been making a great case for that. I think her calling uh, Donald Trump a fascist was important. The tiptoeing does not help anyone. Let's get this fight on the terms that it belongs. Let's talk about mm. this on the battlefield that is appropriate to the moment. And I think Harris is really closing her case uh, with that in mind. Yeah, you know, the great historian Tim Snyder reminds us on the day that the Washington Post and the L.A. Times, the week that the L.A. Times both declined to make an endorsement, bucking, you know, decades of tradition, that authoritarianism yeah. often doesn't, it doesn't always start or culminate with pitchforks, but acquiescence mm -hmm. by people just laying down yes. arms and effectively playing possum. And uh, it's an important message uh, when you see what's happening to our great institutions uh, in the fourth estate. Putting a pin in that for a moment, you know, we're, we have a split screen here. You'll see the stage down in Houston. Willie Nelson just finished playing. Jessica Alba took the stage. There are a number of stars that are taking the stage, but there are also women that we are told by the Harris campaign who have stories, yeah. horror stories, about their own reproductive challenges who are going to be telling their stories tonight. And I think one of the things that really distinguishes the conversation that we're having nationally about abortion is from from other con other other moments when the issue has been on the front burner is the fact that women and their experiences have been placed front and center and that one of the ways democrats have really underscored the urgency and the sort of wrenching horror of these abortion bans is by telling the stories of what happens to normal everyday folks as yeah. they navigate a landscape that has been just completely adulterated by the Supreme Court's decision. There's a new ad out today from the Harris campaign, and I was struck in a season of really uh, just powerful storytelling. This to me is maybe the most powerful ad they've put out yet. This is about Andrea, a young woman who very much wanted to start a family. Let's take a listen to that ad. blanket. First of all, I'm the one that got rid of Roe v. Wade. Do you believe in punishment for abortion? There has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah, there has to be some form. Women will be happy, healthy, confident, and free. You will no longer be thinking about abortion. It's so all they talk about, abortion. You will no longer be abandoned, lonely, or scared. You will no longer have anxiety. You will be protected, and I will be your protector. Sherilyn, to juxtapose that woman's story with the sound of Trump praising his decision to appoint Supreme Court justices who would end a woman's right to choose this powerful stuff. What's your reaction to it? 
You know, my reaction watching this, Alex, is that we are in such a powerful political and cultural moment. You know, women have been conditioned to remain silent about a part of our lives that's so important. We start out as girls being quiet and furtive about getting our periods. Um, we don't talk about um, publicly about abortion. We have been taught not to do that. Women don't talk about miscarriages. Women who have miscarriages always say, I didn't realize so many people have miscarriages. We don't talk about menopause. And over uh, the last two years since the Dobbs decision, we have heard women talking about all those issues. They think they're scoring when they talk about tampon Tim Waltz or when they try to um, you know, have Trump saying you're going to be protected. I think women are feeling a liberation. We're finding a voice about our sexuality and our health uh, that we have been trained to keep out of the public square and we have a right to talk about it and so hearing that testimonial and then hearing Trump over it uh, interestingly his voice is louder it's harsher it um, is more certain and yet hers is the voice that rings in your ear because it's truth it's the truth of lives that many women lead and it's time we talk about this front and center. You know, when you read the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision and this all this, you know, stuff about the 1700s and what happens in the 1700s and all this theoretical stuff, we've got to ground this in the reality of women's lives. And if there's one thing that is coming out of this, it is the boldness of women being prepared to talk about their health and particularly their reproductive health and talking about reproductive health care as health care. Uh, which is something that I think is powerful and important. And we could have no better ambassador. I mean, you can see this with Vice President Harris. She came alive after the Dobbs decision. She is able to speak about this issue in a way that is so powerful and so authentic that it has touched every other aspect of her public presentation. And she has truly stepped into this moment and has made it her own. Uh, and made it a, a moment that all women can embrace and be a part of whatever our age and whatever our history. We all have heard these stories. We know these stories to be true. And uh, I don't think you're going to be able to put it back in the box. And uh, th that has to motivate, um, I think, many women as they as they uh, think about who they're going to vote for. Yeah, so Kamala Harris is certainly going to make the moment her own tonight. You can see the live shot uh, down in Houston. This is the focus of yeah. her closing message tonight. Um, Sherilyn, it's so great to have your deeply thoughtful analysis uh, this Friday night as we wait for the Vice President Harris to take the stage. Thank you for making some time this Friday night. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Good night. We are continuing to monitor that stage down in Houston where Beyonce and Vice President Harris are getting ready to take the stage. We're going to be right back to, after a quick break. Hang with us. This is a live look at the Shell Energy Stadium down in Houston, Texas, where the Harris campaign is holding one of the biggest rallies of the campaign season in the final stretch of this race. You're, you're looking at Amanda Zorowski and her husband. Zorowski has been a powerful and prominent voice on the issue of abortion, retelling her personal struggles around reproductive choice as a surrogate for the Harris campaign. Let's take a listen. I want to tell every last voter, including each and every man out there, that this is our fight too. The decision about, that's right, that's right. And the decision about if and when to start a family should be ours to make, not Donald Trump's, not Ted Cruz's. That's why we need to elect Vice President Harris, Representative Colin Allred, and Democrats up and down the ballot to restore our reproductive freedom. Okay, joining me now is my MSNBC colleague, Simone Sanders Townsend, of course, co-host of The Weekend, and Julian Castro, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Simone and Julian, thank you so much for being here tonight. Simone, first, let me just get your thoughts as a, as a campaign expert here. The notion that Kamala Harris has gone to Texas, mm. which is sort of the geographical equivalent of going on to Fox News to make her point, um, but going down to Texas 
to make a case for abortion and the choice at hand. And, and by the way, not just for women in Texas, but women all over this country, even in blue states where there are abortion protections. We know that the vice president is going to be talking about abortion bans and mm -hmm. a Trump federal abortion ban affecting everybody in this country. And she's really trying to underscore the importance of the issue and the urgency of the issue as voters uh, head towards the ballot. I wonder what you think about the sort of um, the set piece of making that case down in, in Texas. I think it is very important, Alex. It's good to be here with you tonight. And uh, my favorite, Castro, don't tell your brother. Um, but I mean, truly, I mean, as you, as, you, as you started speaking, it was Colin Allred that just took the stage, the congressman from Texas running um, as a challenger for, in the Senate race against Ted Cruz this cycle. And Amanda Zorowski and her husband spoke before him. Vice President Harris is going down there to put a spotlight on this issue that has been a lightning rod um, for families and people across the country, and also really a boon for Democrats when it comes to their efforts to take back the House and hold on to the Senate. Um, Senator Gary Peters, who runs the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, uh, believes that Texas is a pickup opportunity for them in Colin Allred. This race is very close. But also, I think there's something um, deeper happening here as well. I have been listening all day, Alex, as people talk about on the pundits, on the TVs, in the papers, on the uh, social media. It's democracy an argument. Ah, I don't know if democracy is an argument, but the economy, but democracy. Ah. In every place in the South across this country, except Virginia, if you are a woman and you go into uh, a hospital, an emergency room, and you need emergency care, they are going to give you a pregnancy test. To be clear, in every state in this country, if you are a woman and you go into the hospital, they are going to give you a pregnancy test. I don't know if people know that, but they te they give you a pregnancy test whether you ask for one or not before they decide how if they're going how they're going to treat you. And in every state in the South except Virginia, if you are pregnant, there are there is just some treatment you will not be able to receive, even if your life is at stake. That is what we are talking about here. This is not an existential conversation anymore for women all across this country, especially women in Texas who have been living in ground zero uh, in ground zero of this for so long. And so that is what we are going to see tonight. The vice president put a spotlight on this. I know everyone's excited about Beyonce performing, but people may have forgotten. But Beyonce, too, had a had a brush with um, a pregnancy scare and an issue in terms of the health care that she received at the hospital. So this is an issue that cuts across socioeconomic lines, that cuts across geographic lines. It affects women across the board, frankly. And we are talking about people's lives and livelihoods and the ability to make your own decisions. So that's what I think is really just poignant here. Um, as you mentioned, Colin Allred, who is in that fight against Ted Cruz, I want to just take a little listen to what he's saying on stage tonight. Let's dip in. There's one thing I know for sure of that debate. It's that everything is bigger in Texas, but Ted Cruz is too small for Texas. He's too small. He's too small for Texas. You know what small people do? Is when you lose an election, you think, you know what, I'm going to try and overturn that election. I know many, many of y'all probably know where you were on January 6th. I know where I was. I was on the House floor doing my job. I remember when they locked all the doors. We barred the doors the president walked through to deliver the State of the Union with furniture that we usually use to hold paper. I texted my wife, Allie, who was seven months pregnant with our son, Cameron. Whatever happens, I love you. Because we need the only former NFL linebacker in the room. And there's a mob at the door. Everybody's like, what you going to do, Colin? And I went to public school in Texas. I'm not just going to sit there. So I took off my suit jacket. I took off my suit jacket, and I was prepared to defend the House floor from that mob. That's what happened. At the same time, after he'd gone around the country lying about the election, after he'd been the objector to the results in Arizona, Ted Cruz was hiding in a supply closet. That's okay. That's okay. I don't want him to get hurt by the mob. The point is, there shouldn't have been a mob. 
There shouldn't have been one. And if you summon one, and then you run for United States Senate, you got to lose your job. That's what you got to do. And he's too small for Texas, because when 30 million Texans were relying on him, when the lights went out, he decided to go to Cancun. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? If your neighbor needed help in a crisis, you would go check on them. Can you imagine having the privilege and the responsibility of representing our great state, and a crisis hits our state, and you think, I need to go check out the Ritz-Carlton in Cancun? You wouldn't do it. But I'll tell you what, if you did, and you ran for office again, you got to lose your job. That's what's got to happen. I, I have to ask you, uh, Julian Castro, given, given your experience uh, in, in government and you are a son of Texas, what you make of the, the Colin Allred, Ted Cruz mash, mashup, uh, mashup, matchup, not mashup, you, you just heard Colin Allred there saying Ted Cruz is too small for Texas and recalling January 6th and divulging, I don't know if we knew this before, that Ted Cruz was hiding in a supply closet on January 6th, which is according to yeah. Colin Allred. Um, I had not heard that before. Uh, there's always hope in, in Democratic hearts about unseating Ted Cruz in the Senate. Um, can you give us an honest assessment of where you think the race is and and what's happening with the, 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 the Democratic majority in Texas that has not yet come to fruition? Well, I mean, let's start, Alex, by saying I know that every time, every cycle when this issue comes up of could Texas flip, that there are a lot of people kind of rolling their eyes and saying, I've heard this over and over again. But just in, in 10 seconds, Texas went from 2012, Obama losing it to Romney by 16 points, to 2020, uh, Joe Biden losing it to Donald Trump by five and a half points. And in Trump's first midterm, 2018, Colin Allred and Lizzie Fletcher took two swing districts in the DFW and Houston area. Uh, in the state house, Democrats gained 12 seats and they gained two state Senate seats. And then it's basically held constant since then. So Texas very much has been moving to the middle. Now in this race, uh, Colin Edward Allred is between three and four points behind according to the polling averages. But I think that he has a legitimate shot. And I'll tell you why. Um, Ted Cruz is probably the least likable statewide politician, maybe other than the attorney, attorney general, uh, Paxton. Uh, so I think he's the most vulnerable. And a few years ago, Republicans did away with straight ticket voting in Texas. That means, you know, where you can go in and used to be able to say, no, I'm just voting all Republican. Now you have to go race by race, campaign by campaign. And I think there are a decent number of Republicans. And we've started to see some Republicans come out in the last couple of weeks endorsing Colin Allred. But a good number of Republicans that may vote for Donald Trump even, but are gonna skip that race with Ted Cruz or vote against him or vote for the Libertarian, it wouldn't surprise me at all if this is a super close race within one point. And I think that Allred has you know, an outside shot of winning the race here in Texas. Simone, can you weigh in on, on Colin Allred and compare him, if you, if you might, in terms of general Texas appeal to Beto O'Rourke, who's probably the most high profile challenger that the country has, you know, followed the sagas of over the course of the last decade? Yeah, look, I think that Beto O'Rourke did a lot of work to bring Democrats to the moment that they are in right now when it comes to um, Texas. The demographics also, obviously, over the course of years have changed in Texas. But the Texas Democratic Party has also been built back up. Um, Beto came within points. I mean, he was very close to beating, um, to, to winning his race when he was in uh, the Senate race, uh, that cycle. And he didn't walk away after that. He did a bunch of infrastructure work within the Democratic Party apparatus. In Texas, I just, I do think that this issue of abortion Abortion, um, and voting rights, right? Never forget, uh, Colin Allred often talks about how he was a, he talks about how he was an NFL linebacker, and he also talks about that he was a civil rights lawyer, a voting rights lawyer, which is important because Texas is also ground zero for many of the voting rights fights. Never forget, it was the Texas state legislatures who, in 2021, um, the Democrats who organized a, a, a walkout, if you will, off the floor to keep their Republican counterparts from passing um, particular voting um, legis voting rights, well, not voting 
voting rights, the antithesis of voting rights legislation. Um, and it, it, it became a national story. And so it's ground zero for all of these many different fights that Colin Allred is uniquely positioned to speak to. Um, and frankly, the exchange on the issue of abortion that Latinas and Latinos are not nearly as conservative as they've been characterized as. So whether it's in Arizona or Nevada, where they're gonna have ballot issues uh, to vote on uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, or in Texas, I think people would be surprised that um, a, a plurality or sometimes a majority of Latinos actually say no, that they support uh, preserving the right to an abortion, at least under certain circumstances. And so that gives an opportunity in Texas even uh, to highlight this issue. And I think it's very smart for Kamala Harris to be there tonight in Houston uh, because Texas has such a reputation, well-deserved, of being very extreme and anti-abortion. Um, I want to bring in Michigan State Senator Mallory McMorrow. Mallory, I think we have you with us. I'm very interested to know how you are looking at this event that the Harris campaign is, is staging in Houston, where they're trying to put abortion and reproductive choice back on the front burner in terms of messaging in the home stretch of this campaign. And we know from advance remarks that we've been serviced by the campaign that the vice president is going to talk about the fact that even if women find themselves in states with better abortion protections than certainly in Texas, that they shouldn't feel any sense of comfort or that that's an insurance policy against a, a Trump abortion ban. Because if Trump is the president, once again, a federal abortion ban will affect every single state. Um, can, can you talk to me about how resonant the issue is in your state right now and whether or not you think the efforts tonight in Houston will resonate, will will reach the, the voters that the Harris campaign is clearly hoping it does in such a key battleground? Yeah, Alex, I, absolutely, it will. You know, I think that something that has been so galling about Trump's approach to abortion is this idea that, well, he sent it to the states, and that's what everybody wanted. So now we live in a country where, depending on your state boundaries, you may not have access to the very fundamental right of deciding if and when is right for you to get pregnant or the security to know that if that pregnancy goes wrong, which it does so much more often than most people realize, that you have access to health care. In Michigan, we codified uh, abortion access in our state constitution with a 2022 ballot initiative. That initiative collected more signatures than any other issue in state history. But Michiganders that I talked to this cycle, women in places like Macomb County or Downriver that have been trending away from Democrats, this is still a very salient issue because, you know, we don't live in a bubble where we only read about Michigan. We are reading about Amber Thurman in Georgia. We're reading about Ryan Hamilton in Texas sharing the story of finding his wife collapsed on the floor when she was denied care at the hospital. We've read stories about a 10-year-old girl from Ohio having to cross the border into Indiana, two of our neighboring states, after she was raped and found herself pregnant. So there is a very deep sense here in Michigan that a right that we worked so hard for can be stripped away from us once again for the second time in just a short number of years. And women and frankly, their families are incredibly fired up. And for the vice president to go into Texas just sends the message that this is a national issue. Women's rights are universal. It should not matter where in this country you live. Um that to uh, sort of put a finer point on on that very you know key observation Mallory the the event tonight in Houston has 30,000 attendees according to the latest report from the Harris campaign and you know it is quite obvious that when you put Beyonce Knowles Carter on stage with Kamala Harris the beginning and end of this event do not do not stay in Texas. What happens in Texas does not stay in Texas. There will be there are 30,000 people who will see it live, but this will be seen and clipped on social media across the Internet in the final days of this campaign, which is clearly exactly what the Harris campaign is going for. Um, Simone, we're going to hear shortly. Uh, we're waiting for, I think, one of I think Andrea, the woman in mm. this very powerful Harris campaign ad about abortion that was released today. She'll be taking the stage. 
Beyonce and I believe Beyonce's mother will also be taking the stage momentarily. As we wait for them, Simone, I don't know if you had read about this, but this is one of the more galling instances, and there are so many, of Trump's uh, misinformation and disinformation campaign in this election. There is a new PAC called the RBG PAC, as in Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a Republican PAC that is was started on October 16th to help Trump win pro-choice voters by basically suggesting that Trump is aligned on the issue of abortion with the late great Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The ad features a photo of the two of them together and has, you'll see it right there on the screen, great minds think alike. This is, um, this is, this is a caption from the ad. They have launched two abortion themes, themed ads designed to fool people who care about abortion rights into believing that Trump doesn't have an extreme agenda on the issue of choice. Mm. Um, what, mm. first of all, what's your reaction? And second of all, does that concern you? If I had edges, Alex, they would be snatched, okay? I just, I, I it is, it, I want to say it's unconscionable and unbelievable, but then I think about, I go back to, I'm a fellow at Georgetown this semester, and I teach my class on Mondays, and in my study discussion this past Monday, one of the things that came up was Donald Trump, as we were discussing our news of day, Donald Trump and his stance on abortion. And one of the students said, well, you know, there are strategists and reporters out there who would say Donald Trump has moderated his position on abortion this cycle if you just look at what he said. And I was like, well... If we just go off of these random statements, sure. But uh, I guess I could see how someone could make that case. But that does not line up with the reality of, of what we know to be true, given everything Donald Trump has said and also what he has done previously and what he is saying he will do. So I just I think that this is this type of misinformation. It can be quite effective, unfortunately, because there are people out there, people who know better, well-meaning people, who will say, I, I don't know, I heard Donald Trump and he said he wants to be the protector of women. He said Katie Britt told him about IVF and now he's like, I'm with it. Alex, people, this, this is why people just can't read the headlines and we have to be very specific so that folks are getting the facts so they can make informed decisions. Yeah, I mean, Julian Castro, I, I will, I, do I need to remind people? I'm sorry that I have to, but the, the, new, the new sort of cheer at Trump rallies is Daddy Don. Trump has positioned himself as this kind of patriarchal father figure who's going to take care of the little ladies and spank the naughty 15-year-old daughters. And that's according to Trump ally and surrogate Tucker Carlson in a, in a disturbing and kind of perverted speech earlier this week. Um, I do, I, I want to focus on the phenomenon that Simone's talking about, which is, you know, the New York Times Siena polling that we got today out of Florida and Arizona says about 12 percent of voters said they would vote for both Trump and an abortion rights referendum. Abortion rights referenda are on the ballot in both of those states. How do you read that? I mean, Alec, it's hard to, I would love to sit down and talk at length to, to that 12% of people who are saying that, right? I mean, they seem to be diametrically opposed. Uh, you're not gonna live in a world basically where Donald Trump is the president and, and you have abortion rights. Um, uh, but. Really, Trump is not not even pretending anymore, and neither is Tar Tucker Carlson or or any of these guys that are up there on stage for Trump and out there campaigning for him. Um, this is a guy who likes to play the role of an authoritarian, uh, and apparently there are some people who re who respond to the strongman character. I guess that shouldn't be surprising because that happens all over the world. But I think for so long in the United States, we've thought that 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 kind of thing wouldn't happen here. And so many people wouldn't follow somebody who plays up this character. But that's been Trump's bread and butter in politics now for a decade. And so it, it's not surprising. It's just this time the stakes are even higher. And the evidence of what he'd actually do, uh, of what a threat he is to democracy, is clearer. Uh, and you know, I, I think that when you look at that crowd out there tonight in Houston, that's America. That's a diverse mm -hmm. coalition of people. And that's actually what gives me hope that Kamala Harris is going to pull out this election, uh, because she has a big tent 
She has a diverse coalition of people of different backgrounds in all of these swing states that are reflected there tonight in Houston. And, and I think ultimately, and I have to be, believe ultimately, that that is going to prevail over this dark vision of Trump and his allies. Yeah, I think there's also, you know, to that end, there's there's some some interesting numbers on the importance of abortion, which, again, I feel like hasn't gotten as much attention as immigration and the economy in the closing days of this election, Mallory. But, but again, the New York Times Siena polling from today, among likely voters in the United States, the most important issue for them, 27 percent of them, is the economy. But abortion also nearly it's 15 percent. Tied with immigration, I mean, it is it is in the it is the one of the top it's in the top two tiers of of issues of import. I think the thing that is should should be disturbing to everybody is the gender divide over it. Right, only six percent of men say it is the most important issue, whereas twenty four percent of women say it is the most important issue. Um, Mallory, do you have thoughts on the gender gap on this, given the extraordinary effort I think Democrats have made to bring men into this issue? And indeed, it takes two to tango, as it were, in terms of uh, reproduction. And yet, men, you know, there's the ads that we've been playing that feature the pain felt by husbands in miscarriages and in these wrenching reproductive decisions that need to be made in the context of a family. There's Amanda Zorowski appearing on stage with her husband. He's telling his story. Democrats have really tried to make an effort to bring men into this conversation. But for whatever reason, if in this polling, it really still feels very— um, divided in terms of gender. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because and I would I would challenge that polling a little bit. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking to young voters. I spent uh, the past weekend with college Democrats from colleges all around Michigan who descended on Michigan State. And I talked to young men. Granted, these are young Democrats, but men who said, I understand the importance of this issue, but it doesn't feel like mine. And I don't quite know how to talk about it. And I don't want to speak for my friends, my girlfriend, my sister, my mom. Um, and that is on us to, frankly, give people permission to speak about the issue in a way that makes sense for them. I also think that most people don't disconnect these issues in a way that polling forces you to think about. So if you're going to ask a woman if abortion or the economy are their most important issue, they're probably going to say both. And if pressed, thinking about the decision to become pregnant is the most important economic decision any of us women are going to make in our entire lifetimes. If you're going to push a man in that question, that might not be the most important economic issue. So I think that that is just a challenge with polling is how do you get that in men? But when I talk to men of all ages, particularly here in Michigan after Dobbs, who started talking about knowing a wife, a sister, a mother who had an ectopic pregnancy, who lost a pregnancy, who had a miscarriage, there was a real understanding that this impacts all of us. Uh, and I think as we see this play out, men are going to come to the table and understand this is everybody's issues because we don't want to see our family members, our sisters, our friends, our neighbors dying or having to choose between a fulfilling life where you can go to a rally, you can listen to a concert or, you know, finding yourself in a place where something's gone horribly wrong that could have been prevented if you had your full rights. You know, it's always so excellent to have your perspective, Mallory, <laughs> just because you have that you have you're on the ground and you're talking to the voters. And uh, that's where the truth lies. Uh, Michigan State Representative Mallory McMorrow, thank you so much for your time this Friday evening. I appreciate you hanging with us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but there is much more to come tonight as we await Beyonce and Vice President Kamala Harris. Yes, Beyonce and Kamala Harris, I'll say it again, who will be taking the stage in Houston, Texas just a few moments from now, so hang with us.
mình đã tạo hình xong phần đệm Ngoài ra mình sẽ hướng dẫn các bạn móc một đoạn dây Các bạn sẽ móc một đoạn dây đến bắt đầu từ đỉnh Giữa hai mắt này các bạn sẽ móc lên thành một đoạn để các bạn có thể treo làm móc khóa treo vào túi Ở đây mình vẫn sẽ sử dụng lên màu xanh sẽ lên cho mình 60 mũi bính đến đây mình đã được 40 mũi bính này nếu các bạn nào thấy đủ thì có thể dừng nhưng mình sẽ móc thêm sau đó các bạn sẽ sử dụng phần len cờ này vào khâu bên dưới Vậy là móc quả ít nồi của mình đã hoàn thành Chúc các bạn thành công Hẹn gặp lại các bạn ở những video hướng dẫn xin chào về sau